Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second day of uh, Kernel Recipes. Uh, just a reminder, if you um, want to know if you got nailed by the suspecting drawer here, there's pictures still up here. You might be up here on there, so feel free to grab them. Um, anyway, hello, my name is Steve Rosted. Uh, I'm the maintainer of Ftrace subsystem, and my talk here is basically the third maintainer talk of the four that we're having at the series. We didn't get together and say this. I, I don't know what it was. Some sort of pattern happened where we figured that uh, we should have just, uh, everyone's like, hey, we'll just get together. Um, so the reason why I'm bringing this talk up is because of the way I do F-Trace. So or I, I become a maintainer, I mean, or I am a maintainer. The, back in 2008, when I became the F-Trace maintainer, um, I was submitting to Ingo Molnar and uh, doing things and just basically sending stuff up to them. And th they had testing up on the tip tree that would do the testing. I kind of said, okay, I'll just let them do the testing. But then I would break things, and then another maintainer would yell at me very loudly. Uh, right, Thomas? Um, and <laughs> so I would finally do tests. So I slowly evolved. My maintainership evolved over time, and when you evolve, you do little hacks and little this, and it just slowly builds up into this big contraption. And I was telling people about some of the things I do, and they just look at me and say, you do what? And uh, I've been actually told, you need to give a talk about this someday. So that's the reason why, actually, I'm giving this talk. Um, and also, everyone that knows me uh, knows that I carry this. It's called a camera. And uh, you can't make phone calls with it. And you can't see yourself when you do this. There we go. <laughs> so, let's get on with the talk. It's only 104 slides. So, introduction. You know, this is how I do things. So, I'm not suggesting that what I tell you here that you should do it. This is my ev evolution of doing things. But it also would be great to hear about new tools. You know, I'm just learning how to use VS Code. Uh, actually, I like it. There's a lot of things I hate about it, but I'm trying to become the new cool kid and everyone's, all the cool kids are using VS Code, but, well, but I still mainly develop in Emacs. But one thing that really annoys me when I talk and talk, tell people about things, um, they always say, well, you know you could do that with this. And I'm like, yeah, sure, but why am I going to stop my workflow to do this, you know, when that already works perfectly well for me? I don't mind change. I love change, but I don't like change for change's sake alone. If, I could, if you could prove to me that this would be a better process, I could save time and be more efficient, and over the time it takes for me to learn how to do something new, I'd be happy to do it. But a lot of cases, it's just another way to do it that maybe, you know, I don't care. My excuse is not, hey, everyone else is doing it this way. I should do it this way. That's not really the way I work. If I, I'll do it that way if I could get it done quicker. So this is just for fun anyway. So uh, real quick about uh, my setup. Uh, I just recently, last year, bought this uh, machine. Uh, you know, I got it from Newegg. On a, it was um, refurbished. So I, every so often, I'm like, you know what? I'm going build to a, build a machine. So I try to look, buy the parts, and do anything like this. And I got all the parts together. And this was actually like $500 cheaper than what I wanted. It was actually more powerful and about uh, and $500 cheaper than if I were to build it myself, because it was already a setup system. I think it was like $1,200. And I was already, if I got this for $1,200 on uh, Newegg. So it's a pretty good, powerful system. You know, it's two socket Xeon, so what is it, 14 cores with the uh, 214, that's 28 with the hyper, uh, hypervisor. So that's what, 56 um, virtual CPUs. And here he just misses it when I just called him out. <laughs> so I was just t telling him how much you yelled at me to get me into the setup. Um, this was my previous server uh, that I built myself uh, back in 2017. And you know, I put it up together. This has now become my workstation. So I kind of retired, or I, or I took um, the new server, made it my server, and this is my workstation. And this is my office. <laughs> so I have in the back, I have my workstations. They're back there, they're on there. And there's also even my uh, uh, work workstation, which I'm not talking about here. This is about my personal stuff I do for maintaining F-Trace. And I have like a firewall there and a bunch of other things there. And on the right side, you'll see like the screen up. And I, someone asked me, could you mention this? Like what window manager do you use? I use XFCE is my window manager. I don't have anything up there. I kind of hit that button that clears the screen to pick the picture. And I also use Debian. I've always been using Debian since uh, 2003. And for the 10 years I worked at Red Hat, I used Debian. 
these two, these two little things, if you notice, uh, there's a wires that go up into the ceiling. So I refurbished my uh, uh, office. When I left VMware, I took a full month off to tear out the ceiling, tear out the floor, and I rebuilt the office really kind of nice. So I also put PVC pipe into the, the ceiling and come around because all the machines are behind me. And I'm sitting in there in desk. So I have two 45-foot HDMI cables that hook to the computers. I go up through the ceiling, come down to the side to plug into my monitors. Um, I also have a USB cable that goes all the way up. Well, USB probably doesn't go 45 feet, but what you do is I have this, which is something I got from Amazon, where I have two of them. So you plug in, then you use a Cat6 cable to go all the way around and then plug it back there. So this works just as well. So my, my video, my um, video camera, and my um, speakers and everything go through this thing. Of course, that's probably one of the reasons why I have some issues while I'm on, if you ever I'm on video call with you, there might be some issues. That's maybe this thing screwing up. So this is, this is kind of like how my workflow is. You know, I sit down, I log into my personal machine, my server isn't, one, connect, well, it is connected through a KVM switch to the other monitor that it also shares my work monitor, but I don't usually ever connect to my server through the video or anything like that. I usually connect to my, works, uh, my workstation, then SSH to the server and do all my work on the server. I have my Git repo over there, I have a bunch of VMs there, my dev VM, my test VMs, 32-bit, uh, 64-bit test VMs there. Um, <clears throat> although, any interaction that I get to kernel.org goes through my workstation because my workstation is, has indirect access to the internet. Uh, my server does have access to the internet, so I don't like to have my server directly be able to do any connection to, to kernel.org. So it's a little bit of a barrier, not the greatest barrier, but I do have private keys. I have a net, uh, what's it called, a nitro, those nitro keys, like a UB key that I plug in. You gotta use that to do anything up there. So that hopefully is secure enough. Uh, I always consider myself always, uh, always compromised anyway. But on my server, I also have my web VM and my email VM that's attached to my firewall that has a DMZ zone. And my server has like two uh, Ethernet ports. One of the Ethernet ports goes into my internal network. One of the Ethernet ports go into the DMZ zone. These VMs only have access to the Ethernet port that goes to the DMZ zone. So hopefully it's good. I'm sure there's a way to break through this, something like that. But I figured it's just some line of protection I have. But because I'm using my own email server, um, I have Dovecot for uh, IMAP, that, so uh, everything I connect through goes to my email server onto this thing, use it so I could you know, read my email from any machine, get to see, say the, see, see the same thing everywhere, and uh, post fix for the SMT, so all that. So when I did this, I decided one thing was I found out that when I was getting email and people were sending me patches and I started getting more patches and more patches, and guess what? Email clients are not the best thing for managing patches. Um, and there'll be so many times where I'll go, oh, look, um, I have, first of all, like, you know, I, I could get between 10 to 12,000 uh, emails into my desktop. I try to bring it down to 5,000 uh, emails in my server. And what I do is I kind of look, I start from my oldest and work my way forward. And I just constantly just um, uh, catch up until I get about two months behind, which is about 5,000 emails. And <clears throat> every so often I'll go, oh, look, I found a patch that was six months old, you know, and uh, I'll apply it now and do whatever. So when the thing we we're talking about, I guess, Jens or somebody was saying, you know, what happens when the maintainer ignores you? Most of the time, they're not ignoring you. They just haven't seen your patch. Just because you send an email, don't think they actually see it. And I tell people that all the time, like, you know, it's just, it's within the storm. And I'm like, especially if I'm here, kernel recipes, people are sending me patches now. These are the, this is the biggest time I'll probably be missing your patch. So to help me solve that issue, I'm like, you know what, I love patchwork. So I installed a patchwork server on my VM, my email VM, so I could add my own patchwork. Now patchwork uh, keys off of a mailing list. You have to have a mailing list to use that. So what I did was I put in a proc system, proc file, uh, my, uh, what's it called? Uh, what's, uh, proc mail RC file. And I said, okay, add like my inbox. So I created a my inbox mailing list. So every time you send an email to my, uh, machine, it goes through into my um, patchwork. If it says patch, it'll say I have a proc thing. So this is what my uh, proc mail patchwork thing looks like. So the first thing I do here, and I gotta go here because I can't really see. Um, the first thing is you'll see I key off of if the subject has four necks or four Linus, those are emails that came from me, which I'll talk about later. And this is how I actually 
change my patchwork state. So there's a bunch of scripts. If you ever look at that, uh, patchwork, there's like these little patchwork things that you could update the database with. So when I, if you ever watched my workflow or seen thing, and if you sent me a patch, you've probably seen a for Linus or a for next email. And so when I get the email, I usually send it to myself because that will trigger the update of patchwork. So inside my patchwork, it automatically goes from new to like queued. And that way I know the process of it. Next thing I do is I skip uh, the, those Linux, the for next and for Linus, and Linus, Linus commit, which I'll talk about later. And if it's just patch, I'm like, okay, do some more on this. And the first thing I do is like, if it doesn't, if you don't CC LKML, I ignore it, it drops. So if you see me a patch and don't CC LKML, I'm not going to look at it. Um, so, but if you do set it to Linux, um, this is not quite true because if you send it to Linux trace kernel, uh, whoops, ah, you just lost it. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> you hit the, oh, you hit the power button. So anyway, if you do Linux, uh, uh, Linux uh, trace kernel, uh, Linux trace kernel actually has its own patchwork, so you could actually see the patches on that. So since I try to separate the F trace patches from everything else, so RCU that's sent to me, or the scheduling patches that are sent to me, or real-time patches that are sent to me, go into my, in, my inbox patchwork. Everything that goes to Linux trace kernel, which I now ignore, it goes into the patchwork that's upstream. So I don't really need to be part of my patchwork, so I kind of separate the two. So that way I can always see it and other people can see it. And I also did this because Masami Hiramatsu is now my co-maintainer for the tracing uh, subsystem and he needs to see all this stuff. So I had to have that separate because I didn't want to give him access to my, my inbox pat patchwork. It's, I don't know how secure patchwork is, so I don't want to maintain it to, on a security side. I don't have it really exported outside. I have to tunnel in to get to take a look at it. I have this little line here, which is basically what to say. It's like, you know, this is a note to let you know that uh, you just added the patches titled blah, 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 blah. And I'm sure there's someone in the back that actually knows what that line is. Uh, one thing I don't want in patchwork is all the stable patches. So I get CC'd on all the stable patches. So this is like, oh, this is a stable patch. Just drop it. You know, I don't want to. I don't have to go through and maintain it. I know Greg's probably saying, well, you should at least look at it. By the way, this line is not in the failed uh, patches. So believe it or not, when a failed patch comes to me, it goes into my, my patchwork. So I do have a, I have a ton of patches that say failed that I'm going to say, I want to get to this one day so I can help backport them. And finally, um, if it gets to here, it's going to go into my patchwork. So I put it into the special uh, folder called patchwork, which I have a cron daemon that will come and look at it and then pull that all that into my patchwork um, code. And then down here, all patches that come through me, I run it through superseded patch because some of the patches, uh, this script will say, it will check to see if this patch has a previous version. If so, set the previous version to superseded. So um, I also subscribe to this mailing list. Anyone have seen this mailing list or subscribe to it? It's called what? git commits head vigor.kernel.org. It sends you an email for every single commit that goes into Linus's tree. 10,000, over 10,000 emails per, what, eight weeks? So it's funny. Well, by the way, really quick story, because um, one day my email was just servers just dying. I'm like, what the heck is going on here? What's up? It was right after the merge window. Well, I actually had Spam Assassin set up. So this was actually behind my Spam Assassin. So I was running Spam Assassin on every single commit. And it just, people, like, it took me hours to get any email. <laughs> I'm like, what the heck is going on? And then also I found out that this thing was backing up uh, so much because I've also, I've also did this, which was I'm actually... Because of my inbox, I get CC'd on everything. And if it goes into Linus's tree, it's probably too late for me to review or look at it. So I like to have it get accepted. So every one of these commits runs through my scripts to go update my uh, database and say, get rid of this if it's been accepted. So if it goes into Linus's tree, it's in there, switch, it, switch the state to accept. This also set my machine where it took hours before I got email. So I actually had to set up a separate email server to do this, to say, or a separate um, email thread from my proc mail and say, okay, this runs separately to all my other email. Um, yeah, so first of all, it runs the accept patch. If it's signed off by me, I want to see the picture of it. So what happens is if uh, Linus uh, commits something that has my sign off by, I actually, it ends up in my inbox. And I switched the subject to that Linus commit. That's why you, you saw that Linus commit ignore, because I don't want to put this back into patchwork. And
Yes, I, I know giving this talk was going to be that danger. He, uh, Thomas Gleichner just said, you know, aren't you like uh, going to, you know, people sending me Linus commit stuff is going to screw thumbs up. Yes, it will. <laughs> so now Thomas is going to say, oh, I got a great thing to do and screw up my system. So I'm going to have to put in a little new proc mail filter that says if it comes from Thomas Gleichner, ignore it. Uh, so anyway, this is my Linus commits emails that I get, um, tons of them. Um, and by the way, so this is me going to, this is where you could go to. You could go to the, uh, uh, what's it called, Linux kernel tracing uh, patchwork. If you go to patchwork.kernel.org, look for tracing, and you'll see this as one of the patchwork things. This is a recent one. I just did this over the weekend. So I said, hey, look at it. And then I zoomed in. I found a patch from, I think I was looking for like Masami Hiramatsu's uh, BPF pa patches. And then I said, okay, let's click on one of them. And this is what it looks like. I click on the subject, and it gives you the list of all the patches. So uh, this is sometimes I like to review patches through patchwork. Just click on it, and then look at the I get an idea to see the patches. You can see reviewed buys, everything. It's all for the single patch. Sometimes I do it through the email server or my, my email client, and sometimes I use patchwork. Uh, but say if I want to test it or something, I go here, and I click on one of the normal patches, which um, gives, brings you this. So you can actually take a look at the patch. And then I go click up on top here, where it says series. If you click series, and then say, go down and say, copy link, it will give me a link to the series and also includes the review buys and everything else that anyone has done for you that's already added in the series. And then I go back to my command line. And what I like about this is I get SSH home and do all this because I could look at the uh, link on my laptop while I'm here in Paris, click on, you know, copy the link, SSH home and do wget on my home machine. And I get that the, the same email. So I don't have to do SCP or anything to my machine. And then what I do is I have this little script called add links. This is, goes through and puts in, you'll see in all my emails or commits, you'll see link with the lore link, which is a lore archive. If you guys don't know about lore, it's basically the archive of uh, LKML and all the other mailing lists. So I like to have that there. So I can always kind of, when I look at the Git log, I could kind of find a way back. I, Boris Slop was talking about that in his talk. So this will add all the links to every single of um, uh, those files. And then I do git am dash s which means signed off by, and I say, give me the file, boom, and it goes down nicely, and then boom, I don't know if you, anyone here use git am, and you get this failure in the middle of it, because something doesn't apply properly, You're like, oh, crap, because git am applying by git, it's a manual process to fix. So, this is where quilt comes in. <laughs> so, if you do git am, and you say show current patch equals diff, it will actually give you the, the patch that it failed on. And I pipe that back into ftrace.patch because remember, I switched it to mbox. Oh, if you, oh, where was it? Yeah, I don't know, with the ad links. If people don't know about this bash little command, if you do the little brackets, the squiggly brackets, uh, na uh, you know, one string, comma, another string, it will repeat that line. It's actually, if, if you don't know about this, this is a really nice trick to do in bash where that slash temp slash ftrace dot squiggly patch comma mbox squiggly that will actually bash will turn that into you know slash temp ftrace dot patch slash temp ftrace dot mbox so that's how I do that by the way so I just rewrite the original patch because the actual file is in the mbox now and then I do quilt delete ftrace dot patch because I do this so often that I got to delete the previous one so I always do quilt delete ftrace dot patch to clean out get rid of the other ones so if you try to import one that's already there it's going to give you an error so I just do it by default. And I do quilt import this patch. And I do quilt push dash F. So I force the patch applied. And then it gives me a reject file. And I remember the name of the reject file, because this is the file that I want to take a look at. So now I bring up Emacs. And here it is, I get the uh, bring up the file. And then I go and I give the uh, reject file as well. So I bring up the reject file and the normal file. Um, then what I do is just to make sure I want to make sure what's different, because it's really sometimes hard to see what's really different between uh, the files. So like in this line, I don't know what's different. So I created a scratch buffer A, and I copied the reject portion up in there. I also selected, I go and I do a full block select. And, um, whoops, what's this? Yeah, yeah, so right here, I do a block, or I select here, and I do Control X RK in Emacs. I don't know how many people are Emacs people, I know a lot of people VI available. One thing I love about is, block cut. This will actually, you put your cursor in one place and it will do a um, vertical uh, cut, not a, like a horizontal. So it, after you hit this, boom, it gets rid of all the pluses and the spaces and everything. So now I got the file, what it would look like. And then I take the actual file that I want to compare to, bring it here, do an edif uh, 
buffers, and it shows me the line. So there's really, what happened was uh, there was a typo fix. That's the old patch had a typo fix in this. So I'm like, okay, I know what it is. I don't, I don't care. So I go back to the original patch, and I do the same thing. I do the select and get rid of it. I cut and paste it into the new file, and boom, I got the update done. Nice. Just to make sure, I always do, I check the changes, because if I'm doing a get am on someone's code, I want to make sure I don't screw it up. So I always try to verify that my changes do, because I'm really nervous about, you know, because it's going to have their authorship on it, not mine. And I try to make sure that it's clean. So I always go through and make sure that the patch looks at it. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll diff it to the patch that's in Quilt. And then what's another little nice thing, if you do Quilt files, is lists all the files that Quilt knows about. So the, everything that's in the patch will be listed, which is great and handy in the get am cast because I just do get am and I do the backtick Quilt files backtick. So now it adds all the files that was in Quilt that Quilt knew about. So now I get all the files I know that's when I update get am and I do get am continue and it's all done. Very easy, very quick, very fast. So I don't have problems with this because, you know, Git is great. And I'm, but the thing is I do make a lot of branches on Git. So I, like, if I do a version, I want to do another version, do another version, I keep all my old versions. Um, but sometimes I get a little bit too many branches. So if you do like a Git branch, actually this is cleaned down. <laughs> I have like 688 branches. But remember, I switched over. I actually switched to my server and I stuff. So now I think I'm at 68 on my new server, but I still kept the old server, so it's on there. Um, here, Borislav, this is the... <laughs> I, I, you know, I need a branch hoarder support group. Um, so, uh, what's it? It's hard to find what you're looking for in branches. If you're like, if you did a little change and you did some update and you go, okay, wait, I did this little fix or I did this little code or I did this little patch or a little debugging thing. And I'm like, which branch is it? I have 688 branches. Which one do I look at? There's not really a good git find throughout a search for all the patches. So um, maybe I want to look at what I looked at last. So what I created was this, git ls. Um, you could get it from my rosted.org code, get, uh, get ls thing here. And what it does is it will take all the branches and sort it by, it'll take the last uh, update, the last commit on the branch, take the timestamp and do a sort. So you could see at the very bottom was the last uh, branch I actually touched, which was f uh, trace f trace urgent. But for small changes, like I said, if I'm doing debugging, if I do a lot of debugging or something like that, or I do a little feature that I'm like, yeah, it's a proof of concept or something, I'm like, oh, I'm going to add this or a debugging thing I want to apply to it. And cool, it's so great. So why? Because the number one reason is it's easy to find your change. Finding something that you um, did hidden in a Git branch is like impossible. So I want to make the search for it. So Quilt saves its diff patches in the directory called patches. So I could do git ls, this is why I do the thing, of patches. I have 926 patches. So let's say I want to look for my early print k patch or Peter Zilstra's patch that he has for it. So I just do you know, search for early print k, and here it gives me all the patches I have that touch early print k. And then I'm like, oh, there's the one I want. So it's really easy to search stuff within a patches directory, files. It's, everyone does that. So of course, I use git to make my patches. So I make my changes, boom, 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 and I do git diff, pipe it to some file, and then I do git import, and then I do a git revert, patch reverse on it to blow it away. If I'm like, okay, I'm, I don't need it anymore, I'll go work on something else. And Thomas just told me uh, the other day that he, you know, he has his own little thing with Quilt that he actually he uses git on his patches directory. So he could keep all the versions, and he could switch between patches and patches and patches with just going in there doing Quilt, uh, going to git checkout this thing, so he gets a whole new set of patches. Ingenious. I, I want to add that to my workflow. So I don't ever do make, make modules, make install, make in modules install. Everyone sees this, right? I think this is a pain in the ass to do. I mean, how many people has ever, you know, you did your changes or something and you go and like, oh, go to test the kernel and then you're like, why is this not working? And you realize, oh, I forgot to, and I didn't boot the right kernel. So I've done that so many times. So what I do is I use ktest only. Ktest is something I wrote um, to help me uh, test uh, a bunch of changes. So I used to get all these patches together. I, and um, when I first was, became, was a maintainer, people were sending me patches. And I would always like to make sure it's bisectable. So I would apply every single patch one at a time, apply it, 
build it, install it, test it, apply it, build it, install it. And when I had like 18 patches, I found that took me all day to do. And I'm like, I'm wasting time. This could be automated. And this is where I started the script K-test, but then it actually grew, blew into something that was much more powerful because it was able to, you know, take something, install it on another machine, um, boot it. As long as you have a way to get the, uh, the, the D message output from it, if either serial or if it's a VM, uh, um, if it's a VM, it's really easy because it's just via, like, or if you're using lib, it's the you overse know, console and you can automate so much it has get bisect and all sorts of so I've expanded this a lot more but this is the only thing I use to build my kernels I don't ever do make I just always do k-test and I say here's my machine I do some updates k-test boom it takes what uh, my machine I'm working or the build I'm working on and installs everything and I don't have to worry about it uh, although it's written in Perl you don't need to know any Perl to use it it uses config files so inside the uh, K tests because it's in you know tools testing K tests inside the mainline kernel so it's, it's everyone has it if you have the Linux kernel you could go and look at the examples directory there's a way there's even something for VMs if you have VMs in there and I have a config for each of the machines I test so I just say K test this machine it will test that machine K test this machine I'll test that machine and I use libvirt for my machines I know a lot of people like to use QMU on the command line I, I actually prefer libvirt I don't have to think about things I just let it do it um, because it also allows me to use libvirt commands it makes it easier this is the k-test example of uh, one of my uh, my default build. So I could do things like I could uh, say add configs. I have add config include file because you can put do include so other config files. So I have sometimes I just switch to include and say add this uh, these configs that will turn on locked up. Add these configs that will you know do kmem leak. So I switch between them sometimes. And then if I if you notice that commented out include bisect that's right there what I do is if I uncomment that it will set the flag it will change the run type so it doesn't do the test start here and it will set up for bisect if I go to the include bisect I just could say hey bisect from this commit to this commit and it'll do the bisect for me so it's very powerful I'm not going to talk this this talk is not about k test so I really if you want I'm not going to do it um, talk about it too much because I have other talks about k test and the documentation is actually there's a lot of documentation on it but if you have any questions feel free to contact me and when I run it, it's like, okay, run my dev VM conf, boom. I just wait for it. It spits up a lot of things. At the very end, it says, hey, it installed. Now I can go and do SSH and see it. So for testing purposes, I have um, uh, two VMs, one for 64-bit and one for 32-bit. And I use some, um, Daniel Wagner uh, introduced me to Git work trees, which I think is great. Uh, if you don't know about Git work trees, it's really nice because it allows you to create a separate directory that has the same uh, shares the same Git information. And this is how I, I have one for my 64-bit testing and I have one for my 32-bit uh, testing. So all I, do is, all I have to do is push to my test Git tree, either one basically, and it will, and then I tell both tests to run. And I, I know it's going to run on the same stuff because it's using the same Git information. So uh, before I used to have it in two separate Git repos and I had to remember to push to both Git repos and that was giving me, you know, I screw up every so often. So I wanted one Git repo basically and say, here, check out this branch on both of these guys. and It's got the same branch. I know about it. And of course, I have two k-test configs, one for the 32-bit, one for 64-bit. I, when I used to test on bare metal, I had a single machine I did on my test on, and I had to do it serially, and it took about 13 hours to get through the whole thing. Now I run them in parallel with the two VMs, and it actually the 32-bit 10 test takes about two hours. The 64-bit takes maybe four or five hours to run. So about together, four or five hours to run, I get through about all my tests. Now, I make sure any time I go to do a push to Linus, it's got to pass this test. And there's a few caveats to this. One is if I rebase on top of like RC1, I find out that I find other people's bugs. And that really annoys me because I can't, I will not push anything to Linus unless these tests pass. And unfortunately, those other people's bugs fail these tests. So I'm usually sending really annoyed passages saying, could you fix this? Because I find some workaround. I find out what the bug is or where what was introduced bug. Sometimes I'll just revert that to test it. And I have a bunch of hacks. My k-test has a way of saying, apply these patches before you run the test. And a lot of the times I'll add just another change that will fix someone else's bug or work around the bugs just so I could test my own code. And one reason why I do this is because um, even if I make a comment change, I run through this whole thing. Because a long time ago, another maintainer and I uh, finished off a case of Hefeweizen, made a comment change, submitted it. And the next day, Andrew Morin came back with an email going, bah, because inside our comment chain, somehow we changed void to vid on the function below it. So uh, I want to make sure I don't do anything. It's one thing I was told whenever you, uh, or if you're submitting to Linus, the number one rule is 
don't break Linus's laptop. So I always make sure I will not break Linus's laptop. And I make sure I run through these tests always before I push out anything. This is what uh, Git work trees look like. So basically I said you have my two, uh, I have a Linux Trace 64, Linux Trace 32-bit testing machines, and they both use the dot same dot .git file. And <clears throat> um, for my tests, um, if you want, if you're interested in any of these things, look at it, because I had to give this to Masami Hiramatsu, because I told him I want him to follow the same thing for me before you push to Linus, make sure you test everything. Um, I made a GitHub for the K, I have the kconfig, ktest gatebug that will like, all the include files that the ktest config files pull in everything. I have a git repo for that. Um, I also have the tests I actually run on the VMs. There's a lot of things. I'm slowly, a lot of those are slowly being pushed into the tools, testing, self-test, ftrace directory, but a lot of these things require like trace command and perf to be there installed. And we don't want those dependencies and the self-test stuff. And we do some other crazy things. So uh, we're trying to get in both places, but I made it public. Um, I noticed, I, I was looking at this and I said, okay, I gave it to Masami and I've made several changes up since then and I never pushed them upstream. So I, I need to do that soon. So one of the nice things about this case test, one of the things that uh, K test at the end will tag when it succeeds. So at the very end of the test, if the test works, it'll give it a special tag and say, hey, here, test it on normal test or 32-bit test and it'll tag it, date it, boom, 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 fine. What I use this for is the fact that um, I could do diffs against things, but more importantly is there's been a few times where I go when I do all my updates and stuff like that, and I go and run my tests. And this is when it was a 13-hour test. I go, after the 13-hour test, I go and look at it, and I never pushed my changes to my test machines. And that's always annoys me because I just ran 13 uh, hours of testing, wasting electricity and all that, and all I did was test another machine. So I added to K-Test. The first test will look at the current kit, Git the thing that's going to test and compare it to all these tags and if they match on any one it just it will fail the test and say sorry this has already been tested and there's been several times where I kick it off and I get that failure I'm like what I'm like oh oops I forgot to do my push so I use k-test to tell me that you know make sure you're testing the right thing so then I do is I once I get the test I'll pull it from into my down to my workstation as I said that workstation is where I connect to kernel.org and then I push up to Linus from there and then I send well before I even send it to Linus I always send all my um, emails to be totally transparent I like to I don't um, want to do anything that people can't see one of the problems I have with Git in general and GitHub and all that. A lot of things could happen where you don't see. I mean, you could look for it, you could find it, but it's not, it's not easy to find, it's not easy to search. Um, so one thing I love about email, a lot of people say, really, you're still using email? You know, welcome to the 1990s. So email's great with archiving. Email's great with searching. It's all over the place. So I make sure before anything I send to Linus, I send up a for Linus patch and people will see, okay, this is going to Linus. And there's been a few times like Masami will come back to me and say, uh, Steve, you know, I don't know if you want to send this or something. I'm like, oh, okay. And I'll actually pull back. So usually I'll do this email and then I'll wait at least maybe a day. Sometimes if I'm really in a hurry, maybe I'll wait six hours, but I'll wait a while before I actually do the real push to Linus on that. Uh, for the for next tree, I do the exact same thing. I uh, notify everything for for next. And as I said earlier, uh, all these things sending up is also changing the status of my patchwork inside. Um, so then I run my scripts that uh, do make next and make Linus. This gets me, this will actually create the uh, pull request from Linus. And this is what it looks like. So, well, this is the, the things for doing the email. I use Quilt to send my emails out. <laughs> so I don't use git send mail. I use git Quilt because I have scripts that will convert to, uh, uses git format patch and changes it into a nice quilt queue. And before I do the sending, what I like about quilt is because it has a series file and you can go look at it and then you could do like, um, that will set everything up. So since um, the sending is a separate directory that I have, it only has the stuff that's going. So I just look at the patches. So it's really nice, really easy to actually go through and look at the patches you're about to send to make sure they are actually correct. Because sometimes I do a screw up and you're like, oh wait, I don't want to send it. I know git send mail has that too, but it's all, like it's still, underneath the Git world. Here it's just files. You just look at the files and you don't, you know, you could go, you'll go away, come back. You could do some other things. Like if you're doing the Git send mail, you gotta finish it. So I like the fact that Quilt allows you to take your time and enjoy, look at things and you can stop halfway through and go and have a uh, cup of coffee, go switch your monitor or switch your terminal, do something else and then come back and look at the rest of the files. And that's it.
Thank you. So I know it really wasn't a technical talk, but if you have any comments, uh, insults. Uh, no, no insult oh, for me. Oh, please get the okay, yeah. Um, I have a question. You said you used the Git work tree for building 32 and 64 bits. Oh, so uh, is this mic on? Because I can barely hear him. Okay. I think it works. Is it working? Yeah, yeah, it works. Okay. Um, yeah, you said you use the Git uh, work tree. Um, yes. Have you tried doing the same with out of tree builds? Uh, about the what? Out, out of tree builds. You know, building uh, outside of the tree uh, when... Uh, well, when you gener when you generate the object, can't you do, can't you do oh, that? Oh, you mean uh, out of tree build? So basically, like the alternates or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. My, well, the only thing I do with alternates is I have on all my machines I have one uh, Linus um, Linus dot git tree and I have one stable dot git tree. Um, I should probably ask Greg on this one. So if I use the uh, it's that well it's, it's not the link soft it's where your git repos for the SHA ones connect to like that external, the alternates file, whatever, is stable safe to do that with? In other words, you're not doing any rebasing on your git stable tree. The releases, no. Yes, the releases, no, because I only care about releases. If the releases don't ever rebase, I'm OK. So for Linus's tree and the rebases, I do that because it actually saves disk space. That's a nice thing to do because um, I have a single Linus tree and all my Things are always a git clone with that. I can't remember which option it is. I, have to, I always have to look it up. But the thing it says, you know, dash s, dash l, or something like that. So it's like sim link as well as local. And it does a bunch of things to say, all your objects are actually in this directory. But I've learned never do that to Linux next. OK. <laughs> I did it once with Linux X, and I really, it took me forever to clean that up. I don't think the question was about using an alternates directory. I thought it was about using uh, make capital O equals oh, to use a separate oh, object. Oh, oh, that? You mean building outside the thing? Okay, I'm sorry. I misunderstood that. No, by the way, that's the only way ktest works. Ktest, you have to give it a second directory. It, it, you cannot build inside the, direct, the field. So you have to, in your ktest thing, you do a separate directory. That's actually a good point because I told you all my machines have a separate, um, uh, what's it called? has a uh, uh, separate config file, and each of those config files has a separate directory for a build. So every machine gets its own directory for its build. Uh, Ktest won't let you build inside the directory that has it. So you have to actually say, I screwed up. I have like an output dir and build dir. Build dir should have been the build dir. Build dir is actually the git tree that you're building, the, is the source code. Output dir is actually the build, the O equals in there. But in the config file, you'll see that. In fact, actually, um, if I go through, and I think you can even see it. Where's my example? Nope. Uh, wait, did I have it? Oh, hopefully I didn't miss it already. Oh, wait, did I do a K-test here? That, that came at the end, right? <laughs> uh, wait. Yeah, this one. Here. You'll see, they'll probably have it in there. Yeah, down at the bottom, you see defaults if used override. I have build dir, output dir, and that tells you like the build dir equals you know, Linux trace dot git, my output dir. Also, it takes, ktest takes variables. So I have one, I have one file. Like a lot of times, some of this is in the defaults. I have, like you see, defaults config that tells you do this, and you'll see this dir slash no backup slash machine slash uh, test and every machine is defined so it, uh, that machine matches the directory so I don't have to I just have to create the uh, directory for that machine and then K use the same ktest file and it'll just work hi Steve um, do you test on any architectures other than x86 was it? Do I use it for other? Do you, do you test on any architectures other than x86? There's a EL, um, oh, sorry, ELC talk on how to use ktest for building the Snowball um, ARM processor. So it's a two-hour tutorial <laughs> and how I used it for uh, using ktest on Snowball. It's a, it's, yeah, I think a video is out there somewhere for that. So yes. <laughs> okay, thanks.
thanks for the talk. Um, could you explain why you are not resolving the conflict directly from Git AM? Like, I didn't really get why you have to uh, quilt delete and then quilt apply when you could just open the file and resolve the conflict there with a freeway conflict. Uh, so wait, you're talking about the, with the Git AM, with the conflict file there? I mean, that's the, uh, so the thing is, um, when you get, uh, if you hit the quilt AM, which I think, which, yeah, here's the one. I'm go back to where it, yeah. This rejects file, or no, sorry, this is the quilt patch, uh, this. Yeah, yeah, we get this error. First of all, it, if it's not, it doesn't do, Git doesn't do that three-way problem. Like if you do a merge, you get that um, weird three-way thing with arrows and stuff like that. Um, Peter Zilstra has a script to convert, that, to convert those into reject files. Because sometimes I think reject files are easier to read than the guilt three-way because you don't know what it was originally. Like, well, it shows you what's originally and what's now, but you don't see the in-between state. You don't really see what did it mean to change and what actually changed. Reject files give you that. What? Yes, it's, uh, Get, there, there is a get really, I think there is something that has the three things too, and yeah, that's, I still have, I mean, I use it, but I know sometimes I go use rejects files. I've learned to use normal git now. I don't really use Peter Zilstra's reject things. I'm just letting people know that it exists. But for the git am, git am doesn't give you that. It just fails it. There's an option to do it? Oh, I didn't know that. So hey, <laughs> see, this is where part of my talk was for me to learn. <laughs> Minus three, so get AM minus three? Yeah. Minus three-way. A three-way or something like that? Well, yeah, but so, okay. But I don't know, I, I, I kind of like the quilt way. It's just, because it gives me the rejects. So you're going to be really turning down a three-way. I won't even repeat that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, what, what is that? Yes, yeah, so, so, so it's dash three, and then you can set the git conflict style to, like, um, I forget the exact option, but that will give you the three versions. Of okay. The so you know, another thing is like a lot of things. Git is great, but one of the problems is is you know it's not um, what's the word I want to use? Uh, not trivial, but the word I can't think of it. Um, obvious. <laughs> so it's not not any of the word I'm looking for. But anyway, it's um, there's all these things like people like you. I have to give a talk to learn about these things, whereas you know quilt just is quilt. <laughs> it's pretty simple. Uh, it's, that's why, like, simplicity is really important. Discoverability is really important. When you have a tool and you have all these things way, and believe me, I have trace command that has a problem too. I'm trying to make discoverability very easy. That's why I have, like, bash completion work, stuff like that. But still, discoverability is key um, because if people don't know about it, they won't use it. So even if it's, it's the greatest thing. And it just, it's just kind of a tribal knowledge. You have to come up and give talks before you learn about things like that. But yeah, maybe I will look at doing that. I mean, I'm not against it. If it's, if it, like I said, if I find out it's quicker, it's more efficient, I'll just do that. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes, like I said, I know this process. That's why I kind of keep it, because like, it's uh, familiar. So familiarity is another reason why people try to avoid change. If you're very familiar with the process, and you, you know how things, and you, you know what works and what doesn't work, that's the big thing, is knowing what doesn't work. And when you do a new process, it's not about learning what works. It's usually what doesn't work, because that's going to be what bites you at the end. In that spirit, I learned recently about B4 Shazam minus minus make fetch head that creates a fetch head branch for you and applies a patch on it so that it doesn't conflict. So it has heuristics to find the suitable base to place the patch series on and then gives you a git branch which you can rebase and use normal git uh, mechanics to uh, so resolve conflicts. It saves a lot of time if you don't know where should I apply the series onto. Okay, well, uh, I'm hoping someone's taking notes and posts a blog or something or how to and say, you know, gets tips and tricks for our kernel developers. <laughs> I bet you Linus Travals doesn't even know some of these things. <laughs> Anything else? Oh, thank you. That didn't seem like 104 slides, did it? <laughs>